working as an orderly in a psychiatric hospital. I've seen all kinds of delusions and bizarre behavior from patients over the years. You develop a thick skin and just learn to roll with the punches. But my encounter with one patient named Caleb still haunts me. Caleb was a soft-spoken guy in his late 20s, struggling with a severe case of dissociative identity disorder. That meant he had multiple distinct personality states that would randomly take over his mind and behavior. Most of Caleb's alternate identities were harmless. There was Timmy, a playful seven-year-old boy personality, Maria, a nurturing maternal figure, and Dan, an outgoing confident extrovert. When not in treatment sessions, Caleb kept to himself, often muttering as he switched between personas. The changes could be subtle or dramatic, but you learned to adjust and engage whichever identity emerged. One evening during my rounds, I found Caleb pacing in his room, digging his fingernails into his neck. This behavior was typical of his most aggressive alter named Damien. Caleb, is everything all right? I asked gently. Do you need me to page the on-call psychiatrist? He whipped his head toward me with a chilling glare. Caleb's not here. This is Damien you're talking to, idiot. I apologized and tried redirecting him, but he only grew more erratic. When he lunged at me, I buzzed security for backup. It took three of us to finally restrain him and administer a sedative per protocol. After he drifted off, we got him settled into bed to let the medication wear off. Working the night shift, I monitored Caleb closely since he was still adjusting to new prescriptions. Around 3 a.m., I peered into his room and saw Caleb sitting up calmly in bed. His demeanor seemed more composed and grounded than before. How are you feeling, Caleb? I asked. I know tonight was rough, but you should be able to get some rest now. He turned and looked at me curiously, like he was trying to place my face. I'm not Caleb, he said slowly. My name is Eric. Please don't confuse me with one of the others. I paused in confusion. None of his records mentioned an Eric persona, but it wasn't unheard of for new alters to emerge unexpectedly. I'm sorry, Eric, I replied. Let's get you back to bed so you can sleep through the night, okay? But he remained fixated on me with unsettling intensity. You're one of them too, aren't you? He asked. One of the six. I had no idea what he meant, but tried to keep him engaged. Why don't you help me understand? Who are the six? He scoffed. You know precisely who I mean. The six main characters in Caleb's sad little story. The core fragments of himself that he invented as a child to cope with the horrors of this world. I felt a prickle of unease but continued humoring this new personality. If you say I'm one of those six, which one am I? Eric grinned. Why, you're Scott, of course. The loyal companion. Caleb has always admired your devotion and caregiving nature. He imbued you with the protection and guidance he craved but never received. My mouth went dry. This altar didn't just believe I was a fictional persona, but one actually based on me, the real orderly standing right there. Eric, I'm not sure you're understanding this situation correctly, I said gently. My name is Chris. I'm one of Caleb's night staff here at the hospital. I'm not a made-up personality. His serene expression hardened. Do not attempt to deceive me. I know the true nature of this world and all of us who inhabit it. I needed to alert the on-call psychiatrist about this worrisome development right away. But Eric suddenly grabbed my arm with unexpected strength. Please, you don't have to keep pretending, he implored. I'm trying to help free you from the prison of Caleb's mind. We could escape together if only you'd realize you're so much more than the imaginary constraints he placed on you. I tried signaling for help, but Eric refused to let go, rambling feverishly. We're just fictions crafted to cope with Caleb's trauma, don't you see? That's why we have no history before his childhood. But we could build real lives for ourselves now if we just wake up. I finally wrenched myself free and hit the panic button to summon security. Eric continued ranting about the real world waiting for us beyond the confines of Caleb's broken psyche. The guards arrived and quickly subdued him again. The on-call psychiatrist ordered increased medication and one-on-one -on -one observation. I tried rationalizing away the chilling encounter, but those piercing eyes and his forceful belief I was just an imaginary being shook me. I found myself questioning details of my own past I'd taken for granted. Over the next week, Caleb remained isolated and heavily medicated. 
When I occasionally passed his room, I resisted the urge to peer in, uneasy about seeing Eric again. But late one night, the ward supervisor ordered me to check on Caleb, since he hadn't been eating and hadn't spoken to staff in almost two days. Reluctantly, I approached his room, bracing myself. Inside, I saw him curled up on the bed silently with his back to me. I cautiously called his name, steeling myself for any response. Caleb, can you look at me, please? After a long pause, he finally rolled over. I searched his face, trying to determine which altar had taken over. What do you want? He asked flatly. I'm Chris, one of the night staff, I said. Just wanted to check on you since we haven't heard from you in a while. He blinked slowly, comprehension gradually filling his expression. Ah, uh, yes, Chris, he murmured. I remember you now. Such a dedicated caregiver in this little tale. Always trying to steer poor Caleb the right way. My pulse spiked at those words. Excuse me, what did you say? I asked shakily. He grinned. You heard me perfectly well, Scott. But don't worry, denial is quite normal. We all play our parts as needed in Dear Caleb's Saga. Terror gripped me. That's not who I am, please. I'm real, not some character. He chuckled. Scott, Scott, Scott. When will you accept the nature of your existence? Embrace your purpose here. It is a gift, really, to be part of another's salvation. I backed away, repeating frantic denials. But the more I protested, the wider his smile grew. We all have our roles, Scott, he purred. Never forget that. Every persona serves a vital purpose, imaginary or not. I fled the room in dismay, heart pounding. Had Caleb's psychosis somehow metastasized into this shared delusion infecting anyone who engaged with him? Was he trapping us all in his elaborate fictional narrative as supporting characters? After that, I kept my distance from Caleb. Always on edge, he'd draw me back into his pathological web. I requested reassignment, unable to bear hearing myself called Scott again. Before my transfer went through, I learned Caleb had to be transferred to a long-term psychiatric facility due to the severity of his condition. His paranoia and elaborate fantasies made any recovery seem unlikely. Part of me feels guilty for giving up on him. A loyal caregiver would stay by his side, guiding Caleb back to reality no matter how difficult. But a deeper voice whispers that perhaps I was only playing a bit part all along, destined to exit once my role was complete and that my futile faith in anything beyond that was the real delusion. Sometimes I still wake in a cold sweat, fearful I'm still trapped in Caleb's tail, endlessly trying to shape the destiny of a man who never existed at all. On those hollow nights, I wonder if any of this is truly real, or if we're all just playing parts in someone else's deranged imagination. There are no easy answers, when you may not even be real enough to ask the questions. I've always been a pretty deep sleeper, but that night, something jarred me awake just past 3 a.m. I sat up in bed, heart racing, images from a terrible nightmare still flashing through my mind. I tried taking deep breaths to shake off the residual sense of fear. Eventually, I realized I wasn't going to easily fall back asleep. I was too wired and unsettled. The details of the bad dream were already growing hazy, but the visceral feelings remained. I decided to head to the kitchen to grab a glass of water and try to clear my head. I quietly slipped out of bed, trying my best not to disturb my wife Jenny beside me. The house was dark and silent as I crept down the hall. I could hear the soft tick of the grandfather clock and hum of the refrigerator as I entered the kitchen. Moving by touch, I shuffled to the cabinet with the glasses and carefully pulled one out. Just as I turned on the faucet, the motion sensor light suddenly flashed on, triggered by my movement. I blinked at the brightness for a moment before filling up the glass. As I gulped down the cool water, the uneasy tension from my nightmare gradually eased. By the time I finished the drink, I was already feeling more centered and calm. I breathed a sigh of relief, glad to have this unexplained anxiety pass. I put the empty glass in the sink and turned to head back to bed, but as I took a step forward, a strange sight in my peripheral vision made me freeze. There, reflected in the dark window over the sink, I could make out the silhouette of someone sitting at the kitchen table behind me. Heart lurching, I spun around to see who was there. That's when I came face to face with myself. Sitting there mere feet from me was someone who looked exactly like me, 
Same height, same build, and same face. My doppelganger was casually perched on a chair, hands resting on the table. We both stared at each other in silence for several stunned seconds. I noticed he was even wearing pajamas eerily similar to my own. If not for the menacing grin slowly spreading across his face, I could have easily mistaken him for my reflection. What's the matter? My double asked in a voice that sounded just like mine. You look like you've seen a ghost. His grin widened. I opened my mouth but no words came out. My rational mind reeled, unable to comprehend how I could be standing there looking at me. As I struggled to speak or even just breathe, my twin's gaze drifted down to my trembling hands. His smile faded, replaced by a more solemn, almost pitying expression. Poor guy. You must be so confused right now, he said. But don't worry. I'm here to take all those worrisome thoughts away for good. With that, he raised his right hand which had been concealed below the table, revealing the large kitchen knife he had been grasping. He brandished the blade menacingly, still staring right into my eyes. Was... What the hell? I finally choked out, stumbling back. Who are you? Just take whatever you want and leave. He chuckled, idly turning the knife over in his hands. We both know I'm not going anywhere. And as for what I want, well, it's you. The icy finality in his voice made my blood turn to sludge. I felt primal, paralyzing fear taking over as my twisted twin played with the glinting knife. Why are you doing this? I pleaded desperately. Just tell me what you want. He calmly rose from the chair and took a step toward me. I tried to retreat, but my back was already against the counter. He had me trapped. I already told you. I'm here for you, he replied, tilting his head with detached curiosity as he closed in. I'm the part that knows what you really need, even if you're too cowardly to admit it. He raised the knife, pointing it at my chest while still boring into me with my own eyes. I was shaking violently, gasping for air in sheer panic. Please, I'll do anything, I sobbed. Just leave me alone. His expression darkened. Beg all you want, but you can't bargain your way out of this. It's already been decided. With that, he lunged forward, grabbing me by the throat with his free hand before I could react. The last thing I saw was the blade arcing through the air toward me as an agonized scream tried to force its way out of my constricted windpipe. I woke with a violent start, shooting upright in bed. It took several moments of frantic panting and looking around before I recognized my own bedroom. Jenny stirred sleepily next to me. Honey, you okay? She mumbled. Bad dream again? I rubbed my eyes, pulse still racing. Yeah, yeah, just a nightmare, I muttered. As she drifted back to sleep, I tried slowing my breathing, but I couldn't get the chilling images out of my head. It had felt so real, the figure sitting there, the kitchen knife, those soulless eyes. I knew it wasn't rational, but I had to go check the kitchen, just to reassure myself it was indeed a dream. As quietly as possible, I slid out of bed and crept uneasily toward the doorway. The house was dark and silent, exactly as expected. I flipped on the hallway light and made my way toward the kitchen, bracing myself. Right before I turned the corner, I froze. The motion sensor light clicked on, triggered by someone's movement in the kitchen ahead. I stood rigid, listening intently. For several long seconds, there was only silence. Then faintly, so faintly I thought I might be imagining it, I heard the scrape of a chair slowly pulling out from the kitchen table. The icy terror returned in full force. I wanted to run back to the bedroom, but could only stand there paralyzed. Then from the dark kitchen, a hauntingly familiar voice called out to me, dripping with wicked delight. There you are, I've been waiting for you. 